This is Annette Ross, host of Being Real on Sylvia Global Media Network. Today I'm honored to have a conversation with Lillian Lincoln Lambert, first African American woman to graduate from Harvard Business School. She's a wife, mother, successful entrepreneur, and author of The Road to Someplace Better, From the Segregated South to Harvard Business School and Beyond. Lillian, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to participate. <laughs> um, I read your book and I absolutely loved it. And you've had, you're having an incredible life. You've had an incredible life. And so I wanted to sort of start a little bit at the beginning so people get a sense of where you're from and the road that you have traveled. And that was in the South, in Virginia, right? Growing up with your dad being a tobacco farmer. So you were talking a little bit, um, I'd like to hear a little bit about the values your parents instilled, a little bit about your family life, and what it was like growing up there. I grew up on a very small farm in a very small town in Virginia, about 50 miles west of Richmond. Uh, the town was really tiny, about 300 people lived in that little town. It wasn't an exciting life as a child. There was very little to do. We had very few material conveniences of life. No electricity until I was about eight years old. Uh, we finally got a TV. I probably was 10 or 12. So it was not an easy life. Uh, indoor plumbing, we never got. We uh, walked to school, which uh, was, was interesting as children because we played along the road. And we didn't really know anything, any life outside of that. So as the saying goes, you, you don't miss something if you ever had it. But uh, I just, as a child, I knew there had to be something better in life than what I was experiencing growing up on the farm. But in spite of that type of life, uh, my family was a very close-knit family. We had lots of love and support, not many material things, but as a family, we stuck together. My siblings and I were very close as children. We had the normal fights as kids do, but growing up, we always looked out for each other. I was the youngest seven children. My father had two children when he married my mom, and they were basically adults when I was born. So I always saw them as um, more of a uncles as opposed to a brother. Now, now that this, my sister was became ill before I was born, and she was in, institutionalized most of her life. But my brother, my older brother, I got very close to him growing up. And I, I was the youngest, as I mentioned, and the stepbrother was the oldest, but then there were two girls after him. So I had uh, three brothers in between me and my oldest. So as a child, I also had to uh, fight to protect myself a lot. My brother picked on me quite a bit, so I was always aware that I had to defend my turf. <laughs> I was building me also, <laughs> standing up for myself. You said it wasn't a life of a lot of material things. Um, was that something that you were, and you said you also said you don't miss what you don't have, but were you sort of... Um, Pining for that, dreaming about something else, hoping that life would be different when you matured and and got on. How did you start to think that you well, might? Go yeah, ahead. As I mentioned, uh, because we had grew up in this small town, Richmond was the closest city, and we didn't get a chance to go there. So we had not been exposed to a lot of things outside of this little village. But I knew there had to be something better. But even there, I felt that my family had less than many other families. Simple mm -hmm. things as a child, going to school and having to carry my lunch and not having the kind of uh, interesting lunch that some of the other kids had. <laughs> I saw that as being different. Um, mm -hmm. My father always drove a very old car. Some of the other kids' families had modern cars. I saw that as being different. 
something that I wanted. I didn't know what was out there. I just knew it had to be something better than what the farm life offered. So I, I have a lot of adventures. I guess I spent a lot of time after I even after I left home looking for that better life. And eventually, I guess I defined it for myself. But it was an exploratory journey initially. And you did notice that things were, I saw, I, when I read your book, um, segregated at that time in the South. You were saying that um, children, you guys had to walk to school. Some children, the white children, were bused to school. Um, some your books were more hand-me-down books. I mean, that was also your experience. You were aware of that as you were growing up. Yes, uh, we knew there was a difference, and I would sometimes ask my mom, particularly about why things were like that, and she just said, that's the way it is. Because when you lived in the South on the days of segregation, there were certain things that you felt uncomfortable doing, even though you knew it's something you should be able to do. Um, so during that time, especially with the law, you could get in lots of trouble getting, quote, out of line, as they say. But during that time, as I mentioned, the black kids had to walk to school. The white kids rode the bus. So for me, when this whole issue of busing came up, I could, clearly couldn't understand it. I would love to have ridden the bus when I was going to school. As I grew older, I began to understand it was not just riding the bus that was the issue. It was where were you riding the bus to go to, as right. opposed to just riding it to school. We had hand-me-down books. But the one thing we did have that I'm not sure the kids today have, to the extent that we did, we had teachers who really cared about us as individuals. And they not only taught us the academics, but they prepared us for the life that we would face going out into the world. And I'm, I'm concerned that many of the young kids today are not prepared for the life they're going to face when they get out into the real world and deal with some of the issues that still exist even, you know, years later. So we had limited resources, but we made the best use of those resources. The teachers were well prepared to deal with us as, as human beings. They grew up in our neighborhood. They went to the same school, same churches. And they knew our parents. They could reprimand us and not be afraid that the parents would be upset because they did. Matter of fact, teachers were encouraged to reprimand us. And even our neighbors looked at the children and if you saw someone's kid doing something wrong, you had the liberty to correct them and then report them to the parents. And I do think that's something that's really missing today. Yeah, can you imagine that you how much trouble you would be in if you reprimanded someone else's child? That's so true. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the book was that some of those teachers had to leave the school at a certain point, right? And they were replaced with a different set of teachers? They were what? That the teachers, um, that initial group of teachers that you're talking about that made such an impact, they were such a vibrant part of the community, um, had to leave that school environment and were replaced with white teachers. Wasn't Didn't that happen at some point along the way? At some point, but not just while I was there. When okay. I graduated from high school, the schools were still segregated. They oh. were integrated after that. And some of the schools in the, the, one of the adjoining counties, I'm sure everybody's heard about the Prince Edward County School System, uh, Farmville, Virginia. That was not very far from me. They closed down the entire school system because of integration. And many of those children didn't get an education, black kids primarily. The white kids went to a, they established private school. Some of the black kids went away. Their parents sent them away to school, but they closed down the, all of the schools. Now, in my county, which was Powhatan County, they integrated the schools, I guess, maybe, I don't know what, four or five years after I left. And I do know some of the students went, but some of them didn't want to go. They did not want to go and face the mistreatment that they had heard of at the integrated school. So getting an education then was not an e not very easy. Is it something that you enjoyed? That you enjoyed being being in school? You enjoyed learning? You knew that you wanted to pursue education even after 
grade school and high school or not right away? I know you didn't actually pursue it right away. You went to New York first, but we'll, we'll, we'll go back to, to that part. But did you enjoy learning? I did enjoy learning. I enjoyed reading. My mother instilled in me a love for reading. And I wanted, as I say, the finer things, some of the finer things in life that I felt I've been deprived of growing up on the farm. But right. when I finished high school, I did not understand or appreciate the value of going on to college. And since my parents didn't have money to send me, I basically used that as an excuse to not go to college. And of course, at 18 years old, you know, at 18, you don't think your parents know much anyway. So I thought I knew what was best for me. And for me, I felt going to New York City was the answer. I believe that I was influenced by that. I was influenced to do that because many of my relatives who had left Virginia had gone to New York. And when they came home, they looked so prosperous and that everything was fine and they had great jobs in the city. Uh, what I didn't understand is these great jobs weren't as great as they painted the picture. And uh, I would imagine some of the nice vehicles they were driving, they may have even rented them, I don't know. But after, after I left home, I'm thinking, I don't know how they were able to do what they said they did once I went to New York City and found out how difficult it was to live in that city and mm -hmm. to get a decent job. So it was the experience. I, I think I tell people that I got my first degree from the school of hard knocks. And then I went to college. <laughs> when I went to college, it was my my uh, reason for going was I was very focused. I put it that way. I was very focused when I went to college. And what I would have been that way going as 18 years old, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I thought I could go to New York City, get a great job, make a great fortune, uh, meet Prince Charming, and life would just be great thereafter. Oh, I, I love the happily ever after. It sounds sounds like a fairy. Those are the fairy tales that I love. It never goes that way, right? It never goes that way. So you went to Howard, right? You went to Howard for your and when I went there, thinking everything was working my favor, I thought the world was waiting for me. After all, I had my high school diploma, I had great typing skills, and I just thought the ideal job was waiting for me in New York City. But then instead, you, that didn't go as you thought, as you just said, and so you went to Howard, right? That was the first school that you attended before for your undergraduate? I went to Howard University. And what made you decide to um, go for graduate school at Harvard? Well, I wasn't planning to go to graduate school. I had no intention of going. I was 22 when I started Howard. And I struggled those four years trying to work and go to school. I basically worked 30, 20 to 30 hours a week and took 18 hours every semester. So my goal when I graduated was to go out and get a job and finally, at the right age of 26, started making a, 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 some money and a decent living. But during my sophomore year, there was a professor there who literally, well, it's my freshman year, it was the second semester of my freshman year. He literally took me on his wing and mentored me through Howard and so that's helped me navigate the borders there and took most of my courses from him. And I didn't know at the time, but he had gone to Harvard Business School in the 1930s as one of the first black men to get a degree there. So he knew what that experience was like. Mm -hmm. In my junior year, but he also knew I was a struggling student, so he gave me jobs working in his office as a student assistant and additional work typing his dissertation. So he knew me quite well and he knew my capabilities. During my junior year, he began to talk to me, ask me about going to graduate school. And at that time, I had absolutely no intention of going. I wanted to go get a job. But he kept talking about it. And I finally decided I had a lot of respect for this guy. And I thought if he thinks I should go to graduate school, maybe I should at least act like I'm interested. So what I did is began to look at a couple of schools. So when the conversation came up, I'd at least be able to talk intelligently about going to graduate school. The conversation did come up again. And one day I was at work, and he asked me, um, where was I going to graduate school? I said, I'm going to, I'm looking at the University of Chicago, Stanford, 
and I believe it was University of Michigan. I don't remember the third one. And mm -hmm. he looked at me and thought about the corner of his eye and said, well, why not Harvard? And I just looked at him in total amazement that he would even suggest that. And I thought, Harvard? I have no chance of going to Harvard. I thought everybody who went to Harvard was filthy rich and of genius mentality. Well, didn't need long to realize that neither of those were really true. <laughs> so he kept talking to me about going to and applying to Harvard. I finally said, maybe I should go and apply. In addition, there was another professor there. He was the director of the Small Business Development Center, and he had gotten his doctorate at Harvard. So he began to talk to me about Harvard. And finally, I said, okay, I'm going to apply, so I can just get these guys off my back. I'm not going to graduate school. I did apply, and I just say, well, they, I won't get in anyway. I took the graduate management admission test and submitted my application. And sure enough, as I said, they didn't accept me. Well, that just ticked me off. I decided. I don't know what they're talking about. Professor Titchu said that I'm Harvard material, and now I believe him, so I am going to go to Harvard. Well, I did not prepare for the graduate management admission test at all, and that's the reason they said I didn't score high enough on the test. What I did is got some material, studied for that test, retook the test, improved my scores, or reapplied, and I got in. So then by the time by, by the time I'd gone through this, I was determined that Harvard is where I belong. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you have a lot of determination. Um, were there other, the other kids in your family, just to backtrack, and I'm going to go right back to Harvard and some of what you did there, but were you the only one to get an edu a degree from a college or a master's degree out of the seven? that you grew up with, or did some of the other siblings also attend? No, I'm the only, I'm the only one of my siblings who went to college. None of the others had, well, they really didn't have any desire to go. My, I guess my older brother, not my, my um, half-brother, my older brother, I think, would have been great to go to college. But she dropped out of high school. He and my sister dropped out of high school at the age of 16 and moved away to Richmond. And I think it was because my father uh, pulled them out of school a lot to work on the farm, and they finally decided, I'm out of here. And my father, he tried doing that with my brother and my younger brother and me also, but we were we got a little bit rebellious. And uh, he stopped pulling us out of school. And we just decided we just weren't going to... I mean... I think he fans and classwork, we took a chance. He was probably shocked that we rebelled and maybe he decided he should not do that anymore. My mother my mother didn't want him pulling us out of school. And I think the real problem was the different values that my parents had on it towards education. Mm -hmm. My mother had gone to college, uh, got her degree from what is now Virginia State in the nineteen in nineteen twenty two, which is unheard of for Black wow. Get in a degree, and most women didn't go to college then. My father had no education, uh, and I often asked my mother, "How did how did he even get together?" But one of the things that I think I realized later is um, at that time I think my mother finally got married because she wanted to be an old maid. She was twenty eight when she got married, and at that time, twenty eight is probably was probably kind of old to still be single. Mm -hmm. So. The pickings were probably very slim, and my father was a very nice person, nice man. He just was not educated, hard worker, but he didn't place the same value on education that my mother did. And he thought hard work was the road to success. My mother thought education was absolutely necessary to get a, to be able to reach the goals that I want, you wanted in your life. So there was that conflict between my parents on education. But my younger brother, who was a year and a half older than me, he and I, she, he and I just one day decided we weren't going to stay out of school anymore. And my father one day, he wanted to keep us out to work on the farm. And we said, we told him we had an exam, but we weren't going to stay. <laughs> that probably shocked him. But from then on, he didn't really pull us out of school anymore. What? My older siblings, the uh, just going to school became such a challenge 
they decided to leave home and go to work. Now, my brother and sister both left home at the age of 16. They were, my sister was the older, so she left home first. My brother did go back to school and get his GED. My sister never did. Mm -hmm. Well, what made you think, so your parents had different feelings about education. Where would you align yourself, education versus work? Because I, I know from reading your book that you also are a big proponent for hard work. And for, would you say you're somewhere in the middle, education and hard work? Well, I think it has to be a combination. It's not either or. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to combine the two. If you have education and you're not willing, willing to work for what you want, it still won't happen. And you can work hard, but if what you want requires additional training, you have to have that too. It could be either in a a uh, a career that may or may not require college education, but it requires something more than a high school degree, high school diploma. So it could be a community college, it could be training in the discipline like a trade or a college education. So you have to have a, both. What gave you the inner strength to shoot for something? I know you did have some support you mentioned, but um, for Harvard, I mean, I feel like that's, um, you know, you really had to believe in yourself. I mean, you had a couple people, you did have some mentors, it sounds like, at that point already, being supportive and encouraging. But I mean, that's a, that's a really big dream. That's a big dream. Well, it's a, I'm a, I have a lot of confidence in myself, and I'm mm -hmm. very adventurous. I, I will try anything if I think it's something I really want to do. Um, I mean, some of the things I tried when I was growing up, I'd be really, really afraid if my kids did that now. <laughs> my mom, when I was in college, I would just pick up in the summer and go to cities I'd never been to. With whether I had a job or a place to stay, and I go there and I find a job and I find a place to stay. Because if I wanted to do something, I just think I can do whatever it is I want to do if I want to do it bad enough. And I have sense enough to know, for instance, if I wanted to be a doctor, I'd have to go to medical school. But if I was willing to make that sacrifice, I could do it. Hmm. So going to Harvard was not something I felt I couldn't accomplish. It was, it was very difficult once I got there. I had absolutely no idea what to expect. Professor Fitzhugh did not really tell me much about the school, except I knew they taught by the case method. And he did that at, at Howard's class I took from him were always short cases. But I did not know when I went, because he didn't tell me. I did not know no other African-American woman had gone. And in hindsight, it's probably best he didn't tell me because had he told me, I'm not sure I would have gone. I'm mm -hmm. not sure I wanted to have to go through what I thought may be the issue of going there. It wasn't, um, people often ask me what it was like being there as the only African-American woman. Right. Uh, my response is, it's more like I was invisible, which is sometimes worse than being acknowledged. People, some people just act like I wasn't around. It was a very lonely life. Um, the work was very hard. Social life was non existent. I spent most of my time either in my dorm or there was one uh, African American guy there who was married, and he and his wife lived in the um, student apartment. I spent most of my time, and I did socialize with them. And mm -hmm. she's been a very good friend. She, I often tell her she helped me get through Harvard just by being there. And we're still very good friends today. So I had that was all the support system I had. I, some things I sh would have should have done differently to improve my um, uh, life or enjoy being there more. But like what? What would you have done differently? I didn't do anything to see what life was like outside of the business school environment. I didn't go to Boston, explore that. We can go studying a lot, but I'm sure I could have taken time to do some of those things. But I think maybe I didn't do them because I didn't have anyone to do them with, mm -hmm. uh, other than when uh, Trish, which is just, uh, the, um, the sky's wife, we did things together some, but she was, of course, she worked and she had her circle of friends also. And most of the women 
in the in that class. I don't think they did a lot of socializing either. Mm-hmm. I found out in interviewing them when I wrote the book is that many of them were as intimidated about being there as I was. They didn't, we didn't stick up in class much unless we were called on, except for one or two of the women. Um, and I don't think they socialized a lot. The other thing is, because the school had not accepted women, they just started letting women go to the school in 63. I was there in 69. They weren't really prepared for us being there. We could not live on the business school campus in the dorms where the men lived. We had to live in the dorms at Radcliffe, which was about half an hour away from the campus. And we had to walk to school every day. So it wasn't, it was like we were were removed from the environment. The business school is physically located away from the rest of the university. It has its own little campus and its own environment. So if you're not totally engrossed in that environment, you feel like an outsider. I I, um, I didn't. I can't say I enjoyed my two years there, and I wanted to quit a few times, but I could not do that. That would have been uh, probably the kiss of death for any other particular black woman coming behind me. They would say, "We had one, and she quit." So I had too many people. I think depending on my going through this once I was in it, and once I was, I'm not really a quitter, so. Once I get into something, even if it's difficult, I am going to try to work my way through it and make it a success. What, you talked a little bit about your graduation from Harvard Business School in the book, saying that it wasn't the same sort of celebratory event that your undergraduate degree, right, at Howard was. What was the difference? Was it because that Harvard was just sort of a whole different experience altogether and maybe, I don't want to say disappointing, but like you said, it was sort of lonely, a lonely couple of years. Well, yes, uh, it, I don't remember a lot about my graduation at from Harvard. I was so ready to leave then, and I probably <laughs> only I stayed for graduation is my mom wanted to be there, so I, I was married then. I got married in between my first and second year at Harvard. Right. And, I never should have done that, except I had two beautiful daughters as a result of that marriage. But, <laughs> but I, on my I probably did the same thing my mom did. I was uh, I, I like 28, I should be married by then. But I, I, now I know I should have waited maybe a few more years and done a little bit more exploring on the business world. But my mom wanted to come, and so my mom was there, and my husband was there, and that's the only family as opposed to when I graduated from Howard. I, I mean, I had my, my parents were there, my siblings were there, my nieces and nephews, friends, and I had a big group of people to celebrate with. So mm-hmm. this wasn't a big celebration. It was going through the motions of the formal exercise of graduation. And uh, right after graduation, we left Boston and came back to Washington, D.C. And you, because you've been, you've been, been a celebration. Well, you mentioned even that some of your classmates um, that were African American didn't even bother going. I didn't hear that question. Um, I said you mentioned in your book that some of the African American graduates didn't even bother going to the graduation. Speakers going in and out. Sorry that um, you mentioned in the book that some of your African American other students who were graduating with you, some of the men didn't bother even attending the graduation, which I thought was interesting. No, uh, one of them probably, there were five guys that came into the class with me. One mm-hmm. of them dropped out after the first year. So mm-hmm. he graduated with the class behind me. Two of the guys, Maybe three of them didn't come to graduation. Right. I don't remember any of them came. You guys, you started a group there, didn't you? The oh, African American. Lillian, did you start a group there, the African American yeah. Student Union? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that group? 
Uh, I couldn't hear you. Um, the African American at, at Harvard, the African American Student Union, didn't you start that group with some of the men? Uh, um, I got the last part of some of the men, but the first part I didn't get. Um, the African American Student Union. Is that a, a group that you started? The African American Student Union? Yes. Yes. Yes, me too. I'll repeat it just to say I got it right. Okay. Yes, me tell you about the African American Student Union that we started. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, when I got to Harvard, of course, I was there, and when I got to the dorm, we stayed at Radcliffe, and there were only women there. But when I went to Orient Register the next day on the campus, it became very clear to me that there were few, if any, other African Americans there. And eventually, I did see a couple, and mm -hmm. I didn't know why that was the situation. Mm -hmm. But I thought maybe I was the only one feeling that way. But I found out not long after that, uh, the guys, at least four of them. Were, had the same feeling that I did on why there are so few of us here. Here we are. This is a pre uh, premier university for training managers. Why aren't there more black managers being trained for the world to come? So two of the guys had begun talking to people in admissions, asking questions, but soon realized that they were ruffling a few feathers and did not get positive response. But that did not deter them. We, the, finally, they brought me into that uh, circle with them. We talked one night, and we finally said, we, we think somebody needs to do something. This just does not seem that it should be this way. Mm -hmm. So we decided to ask for a meeting with the dean, Dean George Baker, who was a really big guy. We, we didn't know whether he would meet with us. And if he did meet with us, we were not sure what he would say, whether he'd we reprimand, kicked out of school, or what? But <laughs> we decided it was worth taking the chance. We did meet with with Dean Baker and shared our concern with him and asked the question about why there weren't more African American students at the business school. And his response was one that surprised each of us. He said, "We don't know where to find them." Well, we thought that was a strange answer because logically, in the first place, you might want to start is that historical of black colleges. <laughs> right. Graduate state who were there or in the workplace where they had a lot of connections with corporations who had managers there. So we said, okay, we'll help you find them. We will be willing to help recruit students. And we worked on an arrangement with him, which worked very well. He agreed to send each of us back to our alma mater and to other universities to recruit students. And he, in turn, went out to corporations to get scholarship money so that they make it, some of the students who couldn't afford to come would mm -hmm. be able to come. Right. Alvin Jokin said that I would have maybe a year too, too early because when I went, there was no scholarship money for me. I had to <laughs> borrow money to pay my way through school. But I thought it was great that he was willing to go out to get some scholarship money for students who may not be willing to come if they had to borrow the money. So we went recruiting and impressed upon the people that we talked to what Harvard was like, what Harvard was like the value of getting that a caliber of education, and mm -hmm. we wanted to be sure that the people we recruited were qualified to complete the workload since we knew what it was like and that they would graduate successfully. Right. We, the next year, based on our recruitment, they brought in 27 students as compared to six that came in in my class. And as a result, we formed the African American Student Union to serve as a support system for those students who came in after we did. We wanted them not to have to deal with some of the issues that we dealt with and not being able to have some resolution to things that may bother, they may be concerned about. Simple things sometimes it's like, where do you go to get your hair done? Uh, where, what, what's the church, where the church is located? What are the things to do? Where are some families? Or where's the black community? How do you connect with that community? Those types of issues that we had thought would be valuable for incoming students to have. We also wanted to impress upon them that the workload was very difficult. They had to study hard, work hard, and make sure 
they met the mark and success of graduating. And they all did. So that was the beginning of the African American Student Union. And it became one of the most effective organizations on campus. Many other organizations patterned their uh, 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 formation of their groups after hours. And it still exists today. Mm. And that the incoming students now get taken away for a full day retreat to be oriented, just for orientation on what life is like at Harvard and what expectations are of them and what the, um, the course load and getting that information about the test is just anything they want to know about. And give them the freedom to ask questions that they have concerns about. So, so it's really... The way they started and um, it's still, they have a conference every year in February. Uh, they've had it for a number of 25 I think they celebrated the 25th anniversary a few years ago, or maybe recently. And the conference was named after the professor who was my mentor at Howard. It's now named after him. It's called the H. Nail Institute Conference. So it's there just to help people navigate what you sort of had to navigate on your own. When you were there, what do you think the biggest issue that you faced was? that you were fairly isolated? That, probably that, yeah, being isolated and uh, sometimes just not having the, uh, something you were comfortable just talking to and interacting with. There were a couple of the women in the dorm that I felt closer to than others and I shared some with them, but it was that, and the work was extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. One of the things they encouraged the students to do when we enrolled is to become a part of a study group. Mm -hmm. Most of the study groups met on the business school campus, which was I meant to have about a half a mile from the dormitory. They met in the evening, so once we finished class in order to participate in the group, and then you'd have to go back to the campus at night. Most of the women didn't. I think it was one woman who did. She studied. She stayed once she left the dorm at eight o'clock in the morning or seven thirty, whatever time. She didn't come back sometimes at midnight that night. She was in the library or in study groups studying with the guys. And it worked well for her. She graduated top of the class. She was a Baker Scholar. But what she found out once she got into the workplace is being a Baker Scholar was not enough. She went to a consulting firm and did not get promoted as the men did and finally left after nine years. And she said to me years later when I was writing the book that she was Though she was very smart academically, she had no clue about politics in the business world. And that mm -hmm. had her success moving up the ladder. So that was probably the workload, the isolation, and just the whole environment was not one that I enjoyed a lot. So now, up to this point in your life, and then I'm excited to talk about everything you've done in the work world. Um, but now you've experienced, as you said in your book, you know, what you call the double minority, being a woman and an African-American woman. I mean, did you ever feel like um, a little bitter or a little like, come on already, let's get past this. You know, I want the same, you know, the same opportunities that everyone else, you know, might be able to have. Were you, did, you, did that ever bother you? You know, you saw a lot of it growing up. And you were experiencing some isolation. You did. You were still trailblazing. But um, I mean, did it ever just really annoy you and get you down? Of course, it does annoy you. <laughs> but you know, women are still dealing with some of the same issues I dealt with 40 years ago. Growing yes, it's true. There are still, for instance, at the business school, there were guys there who just felt women did shouldn't be there, black or white. Right. They we were taking up a seat that, that should have been occupied by a man. And even today, there are men in the corporate world who feel threatened by women in the workplace. They don't think you should be in certain positions. If you just look at the number or the lack thereof of women in senior positions, there are not a lot of them. How many women are running corporations? There are few. But right. there are a number of men. We've made some progress, but there's still a lot to be done. And I did a an informal study 
last, well, I completed in January of this year. Okay. But, um, been to speak at a at a company or a women's networking group, and during the lunchtime, we were talking about women in senior level positions or the lack thereof, and the problems of getting them in and retaining them in those positions. So after I did my presentation, two days later, I began to think about, well, this company, this is a large company. If they have that problem, there must be other companies having the same problem. So I decided to do an informal study where I would talk to a number of men and women in senior level positions and get their input on how they felt about women in senior level positions, what their companies were doing, what worked, what didn't work. And I talked about 20 different people in uh, different companies in different parts of the country and in different industries. And a lot of the same information came out. Some of it women not having the confidence in themselves, but a lot of it is women not being given the same opportunities for those in senior management not creating an environment where it made women feel comfortable or men feel comfortable being supportive of women. And the other thing that came up, the importance of women having mentors in the companies. And usually, of course, they have to be men because there weren't a lot of women in it. But some of those same issues were around when I started in business. So they're not all, they haven't all gone away. Oh, no, absolutely not. But for some reason, um, something about your character, I guess this fascinates me, it didn't really make you feel defeated. You know, I think... Well, I, I don't, just because somebody else thinks I don't belong in a certain place doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> That's true. I agree with you 100%. Right. If I, 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 as you... And you may remember reading in my book, The Incident When I Was Negotiating a Contract, a half million dollar contract with a guy who thought I should be at home raising my kids. Yeah, I do remember that. And you, and you yes, and you leveled You didn't say what, exactly what you said to him. You said you made him feel confident that the kids were okay. Well, yeah, he, what he said was, we were negotiating this contract, a long negotiation, took a break, and he started talking to me about it. Just ask, just don't, don't small talk. I asked if I had a family. I told them I did. I had two small kids, and at that time they were, I believe they were four and six. So anyhow, they were preschool. And he looked at me and said, well, I think they're too young for you to be out working. And I'm thinking, here I am trying to negotiate a half million dollar contract with a guy who thinks I should be home with my kids. <laughs> I, I just very calmly, I didn't get into the debate with him or justify why I should be there. I calmly told him that my kids were being well taken care of, and I'm very comfortable being in the workplace. But what that said to me is that I needed to tighten up my negotiation script with this guy and prove to him that I can get this contract, and I'm not going to back down because he probably thinks I'm a soft, weak woman who doesn't have the strength to stand up against him in negotiation. So the negotiation got a lot tighter after that, but I, I got the contract. And I got the money that I wanted. And over the course of the next few years, he became one of my strongest at, uh, at He, you know, he was convinced that I should be in the workplace. But had I, I you... sat down with him and went in with a wimpy, taking a really wimp position in my negotiation, he probably would have just run all over me. Did you have reservations about doing both, about being a mom of two young girls, and you did have a very prominent company at that time, or a growing company at that time, um, when the girls were young. How did how, you know a lot of people? A lot of women are juggling that, or they have guilt about that. How did you how did you navigate that? Well, that's a, that's an ongoing issue, it will probably <laughs> one that exists for a long time, and yes. Almost every working mother probably feels guilty by being out there uh, in the workplace and feels she's depriving her kids when it may not be necessarily the case. What I tell women is, this is what I did, you have to decide what works best for you. And I stayed home for a couple months and, and that just wasn't for me. That was not my forte. I needed to be out. But what my husband and I agreed to is we agreed to make the necessary sacrifices to 
bring someone into the house to take care of the kids as opposed to taking them out. Um, and that meant we gave us some other things. So we hired someone to come. My mother, oh, let me back up a bit. My mother came to live with me when I had my first child, which is probably the best caregiver yeah. I had. I think she decided my father died while I was in graduate school, and she was living alone on, in, the, on, in the country on this farm, and finally decided it was time for her to come live with one of her children. She lived with me and lived with me for 14 years, so the kids had the value of having their grandmother around. Mm -hmm. So we agreed to bring someone into the house that um, my mother could supervise. She took care of my first child. But I had my second only about a year and a half later. That was a bit much for her to handle two <laughs> babies, so to speak. So we brought someone in to take care of the kid, and my mother supervised them. That worked for us. Not everybody can do that. We made the sacrifice to do that because we both had reasonably good jobs, good paying jobs at that time, and we could afford to do it. But you can't afford to do that. You have to think about what works for me and those affected by my decision, your immediate family, and do that. Now, you will have people who will criticize what you're doing and question what you're doing, but once you make the decision that works for you, don't feel guilty about it. Don't let people put you on a guilt trip telling you you ought to be at home with your kids or you've got this education and you're home with the kids and you ought to be out working. Do what works for you. And I think that's very important. Now, that will probably not eliminate some women feeling guilty if they are working and they're not uh, home with the kids. But giving up things to be able to spend the time with the family is important. Because I started my business and I worked from home, I was able to participate in most of my kids' activities. I took them to daycare and went to their activities during the day. I was a, a, a room mother at school. But in order to do that, I spent long nights working on the business. So you've got to decide what you can do and what works for your situation. But it's important, I think, to give priority to spending time with kids, particularly while they're small, and I guess even it's, it may be even more important to teenagers in today's environment anyway. But every every person, every woman who's working may have a different uh, set of circumstances, and she has to deal with what, what her circumstances are and not try to pattern what someone else is doing. And you don't necessarily then value one over the other. I mean, did you, did you see the interview? Did you happen to see it with Sheryl Sandberg? Um, about on um, Facebook. I I have I have a book and I, she's talking about some of the same thing in the book that I dealt with when I came out of school. Right, right. So so it's, it's, it's exactly it's the same conversation. Um, but you still obviously have a great value for motherhood and what it means to be a mother, and you obviously had a great mother, right? You don't necessarily value one over the other. You're just saying that you make these decisions, and you, for everyone, it's very personal and individual. Yes, I, I, I value motherhood, and I value the work experience I've had. And I guess what I'm saying is the balance is different for each person. Yes. Uh, what what works for me and where I put my value may not be the same as someone else. So you have to decide for yourself what works best in your situation. At, when my kids were growing up, I, I spent a lot of time with them. I took them places with me. When I went on business trips, sometimes I took them and was able to uh, have many vacations with the family. I went to all of their school activities my kids took. They were all kinds of activities as kids are today, on music lessons, dance class, all kinds of things, and I never missed any of their performances. Wow. And I think that is important. Um, it, if it's not important to you, the parent, it is very important to the child. They okay, want yes. To be there. And I think making those sacrifices to participate. Um, and I did ask my girls um, after they became adults, the impact I had, and they looked at me like, I was crazy. You know, they, enjoyed, they said they thought they had a very good life. And they tell me that they get compliments from people on what one of the young ladies they are. They tell me that to make me feel good. It's working. So. <laughs> but, 
they they have told me that I can still value in them. And one thing I can notice, my both of my daughters have um, they each have a child. They're well, seven years old. They're two months apart in age. And I can see my particularly my youngest daughter and with her daughter not allowing her to get away with some of the things that she got away with as a child. And <laughs> this one, she didn't. She wanted to be in all kinds of activities, but she didn't like this. She wanted to get out. She didn't like this. She wanted to get out. And sometimes I let her get out. She's not letting her daughter do that. She says, you want, you want her to take the next session of dance, for instance, but you've got to complete this session. And she's beginning to instill some of those things in her that she sees as a valuable lesson that she learned as an adult, as she became an adult. Rather. As a child, of course, she didn't see that, but now she's instilling some of those things in her child. So you, know, you, you do the best you can as a parent. You know, yes. There's no, no guidebook on how to be a parent, but no. you don't always get it right. You get some things right and some things you don't get right. But you can't undo those. You make the best of what you've given your children and hopefully they will become uh, responsible adults and do the same with their children. And are you close to your girls today? Yes, I am. Um, they both live in New York City. Fortunately, they live about a block apart and they are extremely close. That's nice. They're good for each other. And I joke with them sometimes. Sometimes I think they're so close, it's them against me. But I talk to them um, regularly. Uh, they come to visit. They come to Virginia for Christmas. And I spend most of the winter in Florida. And they used to come down once in the winter. And I go to New York uh, once or twice in the year to visit them. So we, 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 we're close. Now, one of the things I wanted to um, ask you about, okay, one of the things I wanted to ask you about your work experience, because I'm fascinated with so many things, and I know I'm taking too long talking about some of the, your experience at Harvard, but um, you said it was more like shoots and ladders than a linear, you know, than a linear uh, um, shoots and ladders experience of your work life and your career life and building your businesses. What... What was that like for you when you had um, Leroy, the two men, one who was like very loyal to you throughout your entire career, and one who sort of, um, when you were selling the company, uh, I don't want to say betrayed you, but you know, there was a little bit of a falling out with him. Lillian? Um, I'm not sure I got the last part of that question. Well, I guess I just wanted to, I wanted to know, through all of these experiences that you had, you've faced a lot of adversity, and you've had people disappoint you, but you've had a lot of great mentors. I mean, what would you say about that? Even the things that disappointed you, even when you were disappointed with, um, I think his name was Leroy? Is that yeah. his name? Yeah. When you're disappointed with that, how did you personally handle those situations, and how did you um, still have overall faith in the goodness of people and you know perseverance? Well, you know, we all have disappointments, and yeah. at the time, you just have to deal with them the best way you see it. At that particular situation, and move on. You can't let those things hamper what happens in the future. You you can't do anything about what has happened, and you don't. You may not always handle them the best way that you should have or could have. But once you have dealt with it, uh, you know it's it's almost like what they call Monday morning quarterback. You can't do it. You got to move on. But what I think hampers a lot of people, they spend a lot of time in the past of what if uh, I should have. You know, as I say, you can have your little pity party, but get it over with and move on with your life. And that's what I've tried to do. I've had a number of disappointments, but I have tried not to let them 
influence what happens going forward. And it's going to have some impact. Hopefully, it will help you be a better person and you learn from that experience so that it doesn't either doesn't happen again or you have a better idea of how to deal with it. Do you think that your incredible resilience comes from having a strong faith? Of having what? A strong faith. Oh, well, yes, yes. That, that is what I said. I'm not a person that wears my faith or right, uh, religion on my sleeve, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I know I'm preaching all the time, but I, I'm a strong believer in... You know, my faith has, has gotten me through a lot of situations when there's nothing that's left your faith and uh, just believing and being able to ask for guidance and direction of a higher power. I do think that is important. Do you think that's been, and it has that, maybe you don't want to talk about it then, if it, you, I know you don't wear it on your sleeve, but that's been an important part of your life in terms of having that integrity and moving forward through situations where you're not becoming embittered, being able to forgive, being able to move on, using adversity as like a stepping stone. Has your faith been a part of that piece of it? I think that all goes back to my, my life growing up as a, as a child. Those things mm -hmm. were instilled in me. I right. didn't realize at the time, but you, you develop certain values growing up that yes. impact the way you live your life. And as you get older, I think you can better identify what some of those values are that you were taught at the time. You may not see them as being values. Like that's, that's why I stayed. We were required to attend church on a regular basis. I didn't like doing it. But as I grew older, I found the value of that as a, a good experience for me, and I, I still do. So those things go back to your training and development, I think, as a child. Do you have a sense that God is with you? Yes. That he looks over you or that he's, that you're not alone on this journey? I'm not alone on this journey, and it's not like, uh, I think, I feel comfortable that any time I, if, if somebody else talks, I can always say my little prayer, and I do ask for guidance a lot, and Sometimes you just try, you don't know, really know. It's amazing how things may happen that you don't clearly understand or it can explain. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that God talked directed me in the way that I should go. That's beautiful. Um, you may always listen, but when you don't, sometimes you wish you had. <laughs> that is so true. Okay, so my final question for you is, um, do you feel, you know, your the title of your book is The Road to Someplace Better. Uh, are you someplace better? I mean, maybe you haven't arrived yet, but do you feel that that's been, that's how you would describe your journey, that you came from this, these humble beginnings, and that you did take that journey to someplace better? I feel I did. Uh, did I accomplish everything I wanted to do? Probably not, but... I'm comfortable with myself. Uh, I've had a successful career. I'm, I'm, I'm remarried again. I tried it a few times until I got it right. <laughs> I enjoy my family. I enjoy my daughters and my grandkids. Uh, I'm able to travel. I'm able to spend uh, my winters in Florida, which is something I enjoy doing. I play golf fairly regularly. It's something I enjoy. I travel a lot. So I have everything I want to know. Am I comfortable? Yes. Um, and I do feel that I have uh, a successful life. I don't, I, I, success, as I say, success is a journey, so you never really reach full fulfillment. I'm, I'm still on the journey. Yes. I will be as long as I'm alive. There's always other things I want to do, but I have flexibility now in doing more things that I want as opposed to things that I have to do. And you're mentoring others, correct? Yes, yes. I have uh, the different people I mentor, and uh, you know, the mentoring is a very uh, uh, flexible term, I think. It means different things to different people. Yes. But I think there are a number of people who, whose life I have influenced in some way, so that's important to me, and hopefully I'll 
continue to do that. Well, I just want to thank you, thank you again for um, for first of all for me getting to know you and then having the absolute pleasure of reading your book. That I hope I didn't talk about too much because I want other people to get it as well. It's it's fantastic. You're you're a beautiful person, a beautiful soul, and it is a privilege to talk to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. Thank you.